Let us pray. Oh God, we come before you because not only did you come to us in Jesus our Lord, the Word made flesh who dwelt among us, but you demonstrate your great love for us and that while, it was, while we were still sinners, that Christ died for us. But we give you the glory and praise that death did not hold him. But in offering himself, he freed us from sin and in his resurrection, you raise us not only to newness of life, but to life everlasting. So Lord, fill us with thanksgiving and praise and that you would receive the glory and the honor. For we come to you in the name of our risen Lord. Amen. I invite you to stand to, to join in the call to worship. Hallelujah! Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. The tomb is empty. Do not be afraid. We are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen as he said. Hallelujah! Do not seek the living among the dead. remain standing as we proclaim what we believe. This is the good news which we have received, in which we stand, and by which we are saved, if we hold it fast, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, and that he appeared first to the women, then to Peter, and to the twelve, and then to many witnesses. We believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus Christ is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He is our Lord and our God. Amen. Amen. Please join us in singing, Crown Him with Many Crowns. you'll please join me in prayer. Gracious God, thank you. Today we express our sincere gratitude for your word and the story of redemption and good news. As we celebrate Christ's victory over death, may we open our hearts and minds to the message you have for us today. Please inspire and guide Pastor Paul as he relays your message to each of us. May we store this joy in our hearts today and always to help us be your hands and feet in the world, sharing the good news. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today's scripture is from John 20, verses 1 through 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. 
Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was him. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabbani, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the word of the Lord. Jesus is risen. He is risen Hallelujah. That's good news, isn't it? But we say it looking back. The people that were caught up in all these events had a very different experience. And for they had gone through a week that, let's face it, was beyond comprehension. Jesus, the one in whom they had placed so much hope. Jesus, the one whose teaching they had listened so carefully to. Jesus, the one who healed the sick and cured the lame, who raised the dead. He was now dead. Some of them may have even carried his cold, lifeless body from the cross to a borrowed tomb where they laid him. I can't comprehend their grief, their pain, their disorientation. They had seen in Jesus and expected him to do so much. But despite all that he had said, prophesying what would happen, they couldn't get their heads around the fact that Jesus is dead. And for them along with Jesus' physical death, was the death of their dreams and death of what they expected. They loved Jesus. They hoped in Jesus. And just a couple days earlier, together with the crowds, they were saying, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Celebrating Jesus' arrival. But on Friday, on Friday, the crowds yelled, Crucify him! Crucify him. So much happened in that week. Happened so rapidly. Minds and hearts and expectations could not keep up. The one who received an amazing welcome to the city was now beaten and driven out of that city carrying a cross upon which he had been nailed. The one who cured the sick, healed the lame, raised the dead, is dead. Now, looking back, we might go, gee, Jesus said a whole bunch of times that he'd be crucified and raised on the third day. Why didn't these people listen to him? Why didn't they believe that? Because Jesus repeatedly prophesied not only his death, but his resurrection. You'd think that if they were listening to Jesus about everything else, they would have heard him about this. That of all the things he said, on the third day I'd be raised from the dead. You'd think they'd be waiting for him, for the crack of dawn outside that tomb. Instead, we find 
a little different in the different accounts, but Mary Magdalene went out to the tomb early in the morning by herself. And she was surprised that the ceiling stone had been rolled away. She didn't know what to make of it. She runs and tells Peter and John about it. Peter and John run to the tomb. I hope you noticed that John was faster than Peter. <laughs> John gets there. Peter gets there. And they don't know what to do. Because not only was the stone rolled away, but the body's gone. And we read that after knowing this, the disciples hid. They hid out in fear. Because as it says, they did not understand the scripture that Jesus said he would be raised from the dead. Other Gospels tell about the women coming to the tomb, and rather than bringing a celebratory Easter brunch, they brought to the tomb spices and things, anointments to anoint a dead body, expecting a dead Jesus. Often we, like they, expect things to happen like they always had. Dead people stay dead except for when Jesus is around and, hold it, wait. <laughs> Jesus' body is there, but where's Jesus when he needs to be raised? They figure, they expect things to be the same, even though they had known, they had seen, they had experienced and loved the Jesus who said he would be raised. They lived, in this case, Mary, John, and Peter. They lived like Jesus was dead rather than Jesus being raised. And I've often said that I, I believe that we often miss out on God's love, God's presence, God's provision, God's power in our lives because we often don't believe that Jesus' words are going to be true or that they don't apply in this circumstance. That the one who said he'd be crucified, dead, would be raised on the third day. He said that about himself. And these people heard it firsthand. They had a hard time wrapping his head, their heads around it. But if Jesus is raised from the dead, do our actual lives and the way we live reflect his being dead or reveal that he is alive? The resurrection is a shock, even to his closest followers. The Gospel of John says, the disciple whom Jesus loved, even John, acted as if Jesus was dead. The Bible doesn't describe the process of the resurrection, but it does. It's very clear that his followers lived as if he was dead. Because what happens and what happened is different than what they expected. They expected the dead to remain that way. But what really happened was different than anything they ever expected. What happened was different than what they expected. What happened was different than what had happened before. But isn't that the whole point of the Son of God? <laughs> that the Word is made flesh and dwells among us? Doesn't that mean that things are going to be different and things aren't going to be the way they always were? Why do we live as if Jesus is dead and things are going to be the way they always were and the extent of what can happen is what we can do ourselves? Why do we live like Jesus is dead when in fact Jesus is risen? You know, even our minds struggle to translate the miracle of Jesus' resurrection into something ordinary. Despite Jesus saying, this is what's going to happen. They get to the tomb, and Mary in this gospel is going, his body's gone. How do I explain that his body's gone? And she struggles to find something ordinary. And as extraordinary as it would be, it was a lot easier to believe that someone took the body than to believe that Jesus was raised. There's two angels sitting in dazzling white where the body had been. And 
Jesus kind of goes, where'd you put the body? She talks with them about her human concerns when God is clearly doing something utterly amazing. She looks for the ordinary. She speaks to the angels as you will speak with each other after the service. Just an ordinary conversation, asking a question. She's concerned about Jesus' dead body when in fact she ought to be celebrating and looking for the risen Christ. But then, away from the tomb, Mary runs into a living person. And what does she do? Mary assumes something ordinary. Okay, a living person in the morning, in a cemetery, it's got to be the groundskeeper, right? I know in the morning, you can see the golf course out there. Sunday mornings, they'll have little lawn zambonis going around with lights and all. There's people out there. I know they're the groundskeeper. <laughs> She's in the cemetery. Sees a person. It's got to be a groundskeeper. Her mind searches for who it could possibly be who's not dead. You know, gardeners walk around cemeteries in the morning. But people you have seen die don't walk around the cemetery in the morning, do they? Jesus is alive, but they are living like he was still dead. Jesus is alive, but they're living like he's still dead. I've asked this question before, but... Walk with me for a second here. What happens if someone gives you $100 million? That'd be kind of like a wow thing, wouldn't it? And, um, you know, would we be generous, you know, excuse me, grateful for the great gift we've been given, or would we be just consumed with what we can do with it? <laughs> you know, we could pay off credit card loans and, uh, you know, mortgages. We could get college education for our children and grandchildren and even friends' children. Someone's been generous to us, so we can be generous to other people. You can bring food and clean water to people who are hungry and thirsty. You can provide medical need, aid for people in need. And then even for yourself, all the things that weren't an option are. You know, new houses, vacations, boats are on your horizon. You can even pay off the church's mortgage. All right, you can make a note that if you get $100 million, that's one of the things they're going to do. But now, of course, a lot of people's lives and relationships have been destroyed by winning the lottery. Who would have guessed? But even then, receiving that gift made a huge difference in their lives. But let's say instead of all those good and bad things you could do with the money, what happens if you got a building, you put a safe in it, and you put all that cash in that safe. And every week you'd go over to that safe and touch and goes, thank you for all this money that's mine. You know, you're not even earning the piddling amount of interest they pay on a savings account nowadays. But every day you go, every week you go to that building. You may even sing a song about all the money that's in there. You tell your friends about the good news. You know, once a year you get together and you celebrate that you received that money on that day. You hide little prizes in the garden for the children to go find and collect in little baskets. There's a nice party where you get together with others and you, you sing and you're happy about that great gift that's sitting in that vault. You've never opened it and neither has anyone else. So that gift is still there. You talk a lot about having received a big gift, but you live as if you haven't. And not only are you living as if you haven't received that gift, but people around you that are in need are going without because you have not really received that gift that has been given graciously to you that you could be gracious with them. What would you do? What would you do if you've been given something like that? You're given a good, great gift? You do something with it. If you're given a great gift, live like you've been given that great gift. Jesus is risen. Yes, he is 
Do you really mean that? <laughs> because if Jesus is risen, you and I and the world have been given a great gift. Something that certainly can improve our lives. And we love the promise of eternal life. But it's not just about improving our life. It's about transforming our life. Someone could give us a new car, and let's say that's an improvement, right, on our life. But there are things that will transform your life. There's the old uh, shot as uh, space capsule Apollo went around the moon of the image of the earth as a small blue marble in realizing this is where we live. Why do we fight each other when we share this? If you've been to a third world country and seen what people live with, when you go to a third world country and you see what they celebrate getting, it transforms your life and your heart. And so many of the things that we thought so important aren't. There's a difference between improving your life and your life being transformed. The good news of Easter, of Jesus dying for our sins, being raised, conquering death, is a reality that ought to transform all of our lives. So often we settle for a better life. So often preachers like me will say, in Jesus you'll have a better life. <laughs> but that wasn't what Jesus said. Jesus says, the one who loses their life for my sake will gain it. Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. Love your enemies. Pray for those who hurt you, who persecute you. Turn the other cheek. Walk the extra mile. Those aren't just things that we would call a better life. That's a different life, isn't it? The Great Commission. Jesus says, go into all the world, make it... The, uh, disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I commanded. Teaching them to live like I teach you to live a different life, not just a different Sunday. <laughs> the good news of Easter is that in Jesus' resurrection, we are given a new life. Now, we can pretend that we've received that gift. We can keep that gift in this little building and come and sing and talk about it a lot. But it isn't until we receive it into our lives. It's not until we give ourselves truly to the Lord. It's amazing. Jesus' prayer in the garden before he's betrayed and crucified is amazing. He, he comes to God and says, you know what, this is so difficult. If there's another way that we can redeem your people from their sins. Let's do that. But Jesus said, not my will, but thy will be done. That transformed life is going to be different than you think it's going to be. It's different than I think it's going to be. It's going to be a whole lot more than I can do. And we're going to have a lot of excuses like, oh, that won't help. I can't do that. I don't have time. I don't have money. I want to do this other thing instead. But if Jesus is raised from the dead, those excuses mean nothing. If we really live in the light of the resurrection, all those things that held us back lose their grip on us. We can sing Easter songs, go to Easter services, eat Easter brunches, but never let the great gift of Christ's resurrection touch our lives, and that would be a terrible shame. Supposing that the risen Jesus is the gardener. Mary asks him what? Where to find the resurrected Jesus? He must have gone this way. No. Mary asked the gardener where she could find the body. And in an act of love, says, you know, if you've moved it, we'll come and get... Jesus' body out of your way. It's an act of love. She loves Jesus, but she hasn't understood what he had taught, hasn't understood the reality of life that he has paid a great price for. 
goes to this man she assumes is a gardener and says, where have you placed his body? And here's the beautiful thing, truly beautiful. Jesus says one word. One word. Mary. And she recognizes who it is. She cries out, Rabboni, teacher. Her eyes and her heart and her lives have been opened. Jesus was raised, and she sees the resurrected Jesus right there. Her grief is transformed into celebration. What she once thought was bad news of an empty tomb is, in fact, great news. When Jesus calls your name, are you listening? You may be looking for the wrong thing, but Jesus does call your name. Will we listen? If Jesus is raised from the dead, then today is an amazing first day of all of eternity. If Jesus is raised from the dead, then all the sins and lies that we fall for are revealed for what they are. If Jesus is raised from the dead, the burden of sin and guilt has been paid and we are freed. If Jesus is raised from the dead, then like he, we can love the unlovable. If Jesus is raised from the dead, then the things that I once held as grudges give way to mercy and grace. If Jesus is raised from the dead, then the world is changed. If Jesus is risen, then the, I can be changed. If Jesus is risen, then death itself is defeated, and we're freed to live for him. Let us stop living like Jesus is dead, and let us live as if Jesus lives. For Jesus is risen. Do I hear an hallelujah? hallelujah. Amen. seated. Um, just because uh, some haven't heard this and like for you to know that we have both sealed communion packages that contain both a wafer and a cup as well as uh, some sliced bread and open cups. Uh, we are, you'll find things a lot easier if you choose one or the other. You know, either uh, this one prepackaged cup that has had minimum or no uh, human touch, 
or the separate bread and open cup of juice. Uh, there'll be people coming down the aisles to signal when your row is invited. Uh, receive the elements and come around to the back side um, to enter your row, and the center row will be um, the third row to come, and the same thing uh, with you. Now, it is an interesting kind of dichotomy that we have a risen Lord, but his body was broken and his blood was shed. And both are true. And both are needed because we are those sinners for whom Christ died. We are the one whose sins were atoned for. We are those who were redeemed from death. We are those that God demonstrates such great love for. But in the resurrection of the Christ... We receive the assurance of the fullness of that forgiveness of the price that has been fully paid. In his resurrection, we find both the defeat of death and the conquering of sin. We come as those for whom Christ has died, but having been forgiven, we are set free to live as those for whom Christ lives. The Gospel of John that we read from, in the, that we shared from this morning, begins with, you know, Jesus is the Word, and the Word was with God. But it goes on to say, in Him was life, and that life was the light to the world. And the light shined in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. But in the wake of the resurrection, knowing that is coming, Jesus says to the people that are gathered, you you are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. A city on a hilltop cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a light and put it under a basket. Instead, they put it on a stand where its light shines bright for everyone. That is living as if Jesus lives. For as we do, his light shines through us into darkness, and the darkness does not overcome it. So we come to this table as celebrating the great gift we have been given and entering into the life for which we are saved. Let us pray. Our gracious God, our Heavenly Father, in such amazing love, you offer us yourself in Jesus Christ, your only Son. For you so loved the world that you gave us Jesus, not to condemn us, but set us free. Lord, as we come to this table, in the power of your Holy Spirit, touch our light, our hearts, and our lives. Take from us the things that Try to tame who you are and who, what you do and what you've done, particularly in the resurrection. Let us not look for the living among the dead, that we might live for you. Lord, we pray that in the power of your Holy Spirit, you'll use these simple elements of bread and of juice to reveal to us the awesome and powerful truth that Jesus' body was broken and that his blood was shed. Not just in theory, but in truth. That we might live, and Lord, receiving this great gift, reveal to us the risen Christ, that we might live for him, as our Lord and as our Savior. Let us live because he lives. So, Lord, we offer ourselves to you. We offer our prayers to you. Using a prayer that Jesus used to teach his followers how to learn to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus, knowing full well what lay ahead, as he joined with his disciples around the table, took the bread from the table, offered thanks to God for it, And imagine what that's like considering his next words. He gave thanks for it, then he breaks it, saying, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Similarly, Jesus takes the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. God covenants with his people. In this covenant is for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you do it in remembrance of me, Jesus says. We're reminded that as often as we eat of this bread and we drink of this cup, we proclaim Jesus' saving death until he comes again. This is a great gift. Are we going to live it or are we going to hide it away? Jesus bids us to come and to live it.
similar way, he took the cup saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Let us do this in remembrance of him. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this great gift, your great generosity, your great grace. Lord, set us free from the things that bind us. Set us free from our expectations. Open our eyes and our hearts to the resurrection reality. Lord, transform us, taking us from who we've been to who you created us to be. Break loose the bonds that hold us back. Pry our fingers loose from the things to which we cling that we might discover the true life, freedom, love, grace, power, provision of your presence and the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives and through us that we would live not just for ourselves but for you and for the sake of the world. For we give ourselves to you as Jesus gave himself to us, wholly and completely. Amen. Jesus is risen. risen Alleluia. I invite you to stand and to join and sing, and thine is the glory. Brothers and sisters, God calls your name out of love. And a great love that he's shown us, not just in Jesus' death for our sake, but in his resurrection to life and life eternal. So I pray that together with all of God's saints, you will have the power to comprehend the width and the breadth and the height and the depth of that amazing love in Christ Jesus so that you might be filled with all of the fullness of God, transformed to live as Christ lives. Now, don't worry, because he is able to accomplish abundantly more than you can ever ask or imagine, and he's already at work doing that in you. So much so that to him belongs the glory in his people, the church, and in the Lord Jesus Christ, not just today, but forever and ever. Do I hear an amen? Amen. amen. amen.